one part of inferential statistics is making a estimation of a parameter based on a sample. That's what we saw back in chapter 8. Today we're going to take a look at the other part of inferential statistics, which is to verify a claim using a sample. So the essential question we're going to be working with is how do we test a claim? And specifically, we're going to focus on a claim about a single mean or a single proportion. And then chapter 10, we'll start taking a look at two means and two proportions. The way we test a claim is we go through a very formal process called a hypothesis test. which is a test to determine if there is sufficient evidence to reject a null hypothesis. What we mean by a null hypothesis, a null hypothesis, we abbreviate it as H sub 0 as the null hypothesis. This is the assumption that the parameter is equal, note the word equal, the parameter is equal to a value. We'll make some assumption that the average height is 60 inches, that the average fastball is 95 miles per hour, that the average yards per carry is 4. We'll make some assumption that the parameter is equal to a value. And this is important. This is a point where the book and I disagree. Sometimes the book will say greater than or equal to, and sometimes it will say less than or equal to. And I believe the book is wrong on this point. The, all, the null hypothesis should always say the parameter is equal to a value. So this is what I'm going to disagree on and insist that I am right. And you have to agree with me because I am the teacher, and the teacher is always right. Right? So the null hypothesis, the parameter will always be equal to a value. Mu equals 7. That is our null hypothesis. And we will assume that is true unless we find sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of what we call the alternative or the alternate hypothesis. And the alternate hypothesis is abbreviated H sub A. And this is that the parameter is in the direction we are trying to prove. It's a very similar idea to our justice system in the United States. In our justice system, you are innocent until proven guilty. The null hypothesis is that you are innocent. The alternate is what we're trying to prove. We have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. What's interesting is in our justice system, we never find people innocent. We find people not guilty or find that there's not enough evidence to conclude they're guilty. This is very similar to what we're going to do in statistics. We will either reject the null hypothesis because there is sufficient evidence or we will fail to reject the null hypothesis because there is not sufficient evidence. We're not saying the null hypothesis is correct. We're just failing to reject it because of insufficient evidence. So let's do some examples and see if we can write some null and alternative hypothesis. Let's say we're considering the question, is the average male height
more than 60 inches. We're talking about the average male height. So our null hypothesis, we're talking about mu, the population average. And the null hypothesis, the parameter is always equal to a value. So mu is equal to 60. That is the null hypothesis, that it is equal to that value that we're curious about. The alternate hypothesis is what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that the, that the average height is more than 60. So the alternate is that mu is greater than 60. So we will assume the null hypothesis that everything is equal to 60. Male height, average male height is equal to 60 until there is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis that it is greater than 60. How about this question? Is the proportion of supporters of a bill less than 50%? The null hypothesis, we're talking about a proportion, so that's P. And we want to know the null hypothesis should always be equal. Is P equal to, what is the given proportion? 50%, 0 0.5. The alternative hypothesis is what we're trying to, to prove. We want to show the bill is less than 50%. So the proportion is going to be less than 0.5. So we will assume the proportion is 50% until we find sufficient evidence that the proportion is less than 50%. In that case, we will reject the null in favor of the alternative. We could even see this. Let's test a claim. that the average test score is 75%. So the null hypothesis is that the average, so it's a mu, is equal to 75%. Notice that's not a proportion. We're not saying the average test is 75, is past 75 percent time. We're saying the average score is 75. And we could say 0.75 as long as we were consistent through the whole problem. But it's a mean, not a proportion. The alternate hypothesis then. What's interesting is this question isn't necessarily targeted at scores being higher than 75 or scores being lower than 75. The question is, does it equal 75 or does it not? So in this case, we're going to say mu is not equal to 75. Let's go back and look at these three examples and talk about visually what we're testing. Visually, what we're testing in example A is we'll have a normal distribution with the average of 60, or is there sufficient evidence to suggest mu is actually bigger than 60? Notice it just fills up the right side. We call that the right tail. The second example is very similar. The average we're testing, the proportion we're testing is 0.5. We want to know if the actual proportion is less than 0.5 over to the left. That we call the left tail. Compare that with example C. 
where the mean is 75, but this time we just say it's not equal to 75, which means it could be bigger than 75 or it could be smaller than 75. And so notice to reject the alternative, to reject the null hypothesis, we have two tails. We call this a two-tailed test because we could reject it on either side. One tail test is on the right or the left side. A two tail test means we can reject it on either side in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So that's the null and the alternative hypothesis. Let's get into more detail about how we can make a decision. How do we decide, do we, ex do we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative, or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? The way we make a decision is we're going to calculate, we're going to do a sample, and we will calculate what's called a p-value off of that sample, or the probability the result lost a vowel there the result of your sample is due to chance if you find out there's a 50-50 chance this happened randomly probably okay to accept the null hypothesis because it, it doesn't seem like there's anything strange going on. But if there's only a 1% chance that this would happen randomly, you'd say, wait a minute, something's wrong. This probably would not have happened if the null hypothesis was true. It's a very small probability this would happen by chance. That's the p-value. And the way we decide what a small p-value is, is we look at what we call alpha, or the smallest acceptable chance under the null hypothesis. And alpha, just like the alphas we saw in chapter 8, alphas usually are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01, 10%, 5%, or a 1% level. This is the smallest acceptable chance. So what we will decide is, in general, most often, we choose 5%. Is if there is less than a 5% chance that this would happen randomly? Probably not really randomly. There's probably something going on here. Now, if there's greater than a 5% chance that it would happen, then you know it might have just been chance. It might have just been a fluke but nothing strange is going on. So to make our decision is if our p-value is less than the alpha, if the probability is that it happens by chance is less than what is acceptable, then your result is probably not due to chance. And if it's not due to chance, we will make the conclusion to reject the null in favor of the alternate. If the probability is so small, most likely the alternate hypothesis is more accurate than the null hypothesis. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. We have proven the defendant guilty. 
However, if the p-value is greater than alpha, then your result is probably just due to chance. And so if it's just due to chance, our conclusion is we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Notice we never confirm anything. Statistics means never having to say you're certain. We never confirm anything. We either reject the null or we fail to reject the null. But we never actually confirm any values because without testing every single data value in the population, it's impossible to actually know for certain. Which leads us to what we call type 1 and type 2 errors. And for some reason, when we're talking about type 1 and type 2 errors, we use Roman numerals. A type 1 or a type 2 error basically means that the data collected led us to make the wrong decision. So type 1, a type 1 error is the probability of rejecting the null when it is true. So we said reject the null in favor of the alternate. Well, actually, the null hypothesis was accurate. So you were wrong. You made a type 1 error. A type 2 error is just the opposite. That's the probability of failing to reject or not rejecting the null when it is false. This is the case where you said, ah, oh, there's not enough evidence to reject it. So we're going to go with the null hypothesis. Well, the null hypothesis was wrong. Your data just didn't give you enough evidence to conclude it was wrong. So for example, let's say Frank's rock climbing equipment is safe. A type 1 error would mean we were rejecting this statement when in fact it was true. A type 1 error would be concluding it is not safe when in fact it is. That's a type 1 error, concluding that we have to reject this statement when we should not have. A type 2 error would be just the opposite, and that would be concluding it is safe when, in fact, it is not safe. Type 2 is not rejecting the statement when it actually was false. OK, a lot of theory. Let's actually do some hypothesis testing. Let's do some examples. Tests. Oops, too far. So example test, number one, first thing we're going to do is we're going to test 
a mean when the standard deviation of the population is known. And just like with confidence intervals, when we know the standard deviation, we can use a z-test. And that z-test means z is equal to our mean of the sample minus the mean of everything divided by the standard error. And remember, that comes from the fact that x bar is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma divided by the square root of n. Standard error, that's what we find sigma divided by the square root of n. So let's say Jeff swims a 25-yard freestyle with an average of 16.43 seconds. and a standard deviation of 0.8 seconds. He wants to know if goggles will help him swim faster. So after 15 swims, his mean was 16 seconds, and we're going to test this at the alpha equals 0.05 level of significance. So first, what is the null hypothesis that we are testing? We're interested in his mean swim time. The null hypothesis is always equal to his mean swim time currently overall is equal to 16.43. What he's trying to prove, and he has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, is that the mean is he wants to swim faster. A faster time would be a lower time, so that the mean is less than the 16.43. That's our test. So when we look at the distribution of x bar, it should be normal with the same mean as the population, 16.43. And the standard deviation should be the standard deviation of the population, 0.8, divided by the square root of the sample size, 15. Or x bar is normally distributed at 16.43, comma, and on the calculator, 0.8 divided by the square root of 15 is 0.207. So to find a p-value, the probability, we need to normalize this, his result of 16 seconds, so we can check it on the table. Z, remember, is x bar minus mu divided by the standard error. x bar is 16 seconds. Minus mu is 16.43 divided by the standard error of 0.207. 
16 minus 16.43 16 is negative 0.43 divided by 0 0.207 is negative 2.08 let's look at this hypothesis test mu is right here at 16.43 we want to know what's the probability that we're less than it. We're looking for that probability that we are in that right tail. So we're going to look up a z value of 2.08 in our table. So if we go up to our normal distribution, 2.08. We get 0 0.4812. 0 0.4812. Remember, that's the space in between our z value and the mean. So to get p, 0 0.5 is the entire left half. We subtract 0 0.4812. 0 0.5 minus 0.4812. Our p value is 0 0.0188. The probability that his 15 swims would have an average of 16 seconds is 0 0.0188, almost 2% chance. Our alpha value is 0 0.05, which means 5% or more is acceptable. But 0.01, is certainly unacceptable under the assumptions. Therefore, we will make the conclusion. Because the p-value is smaller than alpha, 1% that it happened by chance, probably not by chance. We are going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate. In other words, it seems he swims faster with goggles. Because that probability was less than 5%, he must swim faster with goggles. Let's try another example. Another hypothesis test. This time we're going to test a mean where sigma is unknown. If sigma is unknown, it means we are going to have to do a t-test, just like we had to do with the confidence intervals. We have to have more area in the tails. Now, what's nice about the t-test and hypothesis test is we are going to do all the tricky work on the calculator. The t-test is the only test that you are allowed to do on the calculator. So, for example, the students believe the mean score on the first test was 65%. The instructor, as usual, believes it is higher. Students like to complain about low test scores. They don't realize that the means are actually higher than they assume. To prove this, he sampled 10 students. And found the following. 
65, a 65, a 70, a 67, a 66, a 63, a 63, a 68, a 72, and a 71. Is this enough evidence to conclude that it is in fact higher? Well, let's set it up. The null hypothesis. We're talking about the mean, and the null hypothesis is always equal to the value we're testing. The students believe it was 65%. That's not a proportion, that's an average. Be careful there. You can do 0.65 or 65 as long as you're consistent. The alternate hypothesis is in the favor we're trying to prove. The instructor believes that it is actually higher, that mu is actually greater than 65%. So visually what we're looking at is 65 is the average. The instructor thinks it's bigger than 65. We weren't given an alpha on this one. So if no alpha is given, we'll just assume it's uh, 5%. So we're going to see if there's 0.05 area or less that this would happen by chance. Well, let's look at it. First, we need to gather our data, and that's where our calculators are going to come in handy. If we hit stat and edit, scroll up and clear out the last list that was in there, and type in our numbers of 65, 65, 70, 67, 66, 63, 63, 68. We got two more, so I got to move my calculator out of the way. The last ones are 72 and 71. And I hit second quit, stat, calculate our one variable stats from L1, enter. There we go. The mean x bar is 67. So x bar was 67. S, my standard deviation here, because it's a sample, not a population, is 3.1 or 3.20. And now we're ready to go to the calculator. One more value, though, we're going to need when we do our calculator is the number of data values. There are 10 students. And so if we're interested, we don't need it for the calculator. But remember, the degrees of freedom is always one less than the number for the t-table. On our calculator, the way we can calculate a t-test is if you hit the stat button. Over to the right, you see the word tests. And the second option is a t-test. We want stats, because we're going to enter in all the stats for us. So the null hypothesis is 65. x bar, notice it's already 67. If it wasn't, we would have to edit it. Sx is already 3.2. If it wasn't, we would have to edit it. The number of values is 10. Moving my calculator around, sorry, to make sure we get our values. And the alternate hypothesis, the alternate hypothesis is we want to be greater. So we'll come over here and select the greater. And then we will hit calculate. When we hit calculate, we get all sorts of information. One thing we get is a t. t equals 1.98. We'll round it there. t equals 1.98. That's our test statistic. But more important to us is we also have a p-value. Right underneath it, p is 0.0. I'm going to round it to 4. 
P is 0 0.04. 4, I said. So that means the probability is actually 0 0.04, which is less than the acceptable alpha. Because the probability is less, we will make a decision to reject the null in favor of the alternate. Or in terms of this problem, the average score is higher than 65, like the students hypothesized. Hypothesis tests all follow the exact same setup. A null hypothesis, an alternate hypothesis, an alpha value of what will reject, calculate the p-value to decide do we reject or do we fail to reject? Same pattern, same process, every problem. We might have a slightly different way that we calculate the test statistic. Like when we knew the standard deviation of the population, we went ahead and used a z-test. When we did not know the standard deviation, we had to use a t-test in the calculator. We can also test a proportion. in a way very similar to what we did with confidence intervals and proportions. We'll use a z-test again, where p hat is normally distributed with a mean of p and a standard deviation, which is the square root of p q divided by n. And again, as a reminder, z is equal to the difference between p minus or p hat minus p over the standard error. Again, remember the standard error. That's what we're finding here with the square root of pq over n based on our sample size. So one last example: a wedding coordinator. believes fifty percent of brides are younger than their grooms. To confirm this, she samples 100 brides and finds fifty five were younger. At the one percent confidence. level, is she correct? Let's test this with our hypothesis. Our null hypothesis, this time we're talking about a proportion. What proportion are younger? The proportion she's testing is 50 percent, so 0.5. The alternate hypothesis, then, she's not hypothesizing that the brides are older or the brides are younger. Let me try that again. She's not hypothesizing that it's more or less than 50%. She just wants to know, is it 50 or is it not? So in this case, we say P is not equal to 0.5. Trying to scroll to get everything on the screen I can. We'll call that good enough. So basically what we're saying is here is 0.5. 
Is it possibly above 0.5? Is it possibly below 0.5? We have a two-tailed test. We can make a conclusion that she's wrong on either greater than or less than. So our proportion then should be normally distributed around the data given to us, an average of 0.5 with a standard error of 0.5 times 0.5, P times Q, over the standard deviation or over the sample size of 100. So the population is normally distributed at 0.5, comma, Point oh five. So we need a z value to test this, to find a p value. Z with proportions is the observed proportion minus the hypothesized proportion divided by the standard error. The observed proportion was 55 out of 100 or 0.55 or younger, 0.55 or younger, minus the hypothesized proportion of 0.5 divided by the standard error of 0.05. So 0 0.55 minus 0.5 is 0 0.05, divided by 0 0.05 is 1, 0 0.00. So we look up in the table a z value of 1, 1.00 is 0.3413. That's the area in the white, though, 0.3413. Remember, to find the tail, we take 0.5 minus 0.3413, which is 0.1587. Don't forget about the other tail, though. With the two-tail test, you've got two halves to look at. 0.1587 is over there as well. So the p-value is 0.1587 plus 0.1587. The probability that, by chance, 55 out of 100 were younger is 0.3174. There's a 31% chance that this happened just as a fluke. And that's probably not small enough to be considered rare or strange. Because it is smaller, I'm sorry, it is bigger, much bigger than the 1% confidence level, 31%, much bigger. We do not have sufficient evidence. It looks like 55 out of 100, but that's not beyond a reasonable doubt. 31%, there's reasonable doubt there. So the conclusion is that we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. What's interesting, though, is this does not necessarily mean the proportion is 0.5. We have no way of determining the proportion is 0.5 unless we ask every single bride everywhere in the world. So instead, our conclusion is that there is insufficient evidence to conclude the proportion of brides younger than grooms is different than 0.5. So we haven't concluded that it is 0.5. What we're concluding is that there is insufficient evidence to conclude it's not 0.5. This process of hypothesis testing is the essential foundation for everything we're going to see 
throughout the rest of this course. You need to know how to make a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. You need to know how to come up with your test statistic that will help us calculate a p-value and determine do we fail to reject or do we accept. Oh, no, we never accept. Sorry. Do we fail to reject or do we reject the null hypothesis? Take a look at the homework. We'll do some practice in class. Hypothesis testing. We'll see you tomorrow.